This week on Even and Roper. It's a weapon more powerful than you could ever imagine. You are so smitten with Angelina Jolie What's that you're forgiving. That? I don't care if the arm comes toward me in the screen. We get to have a bachelor party. They're going to call this Stifler's Big Movie. This is awesome. <laughs> Angelina Jolie fights death in the cradle of life in the new Laura Cross adventure. It's one of six new movies this week, including another look at Seabiscuit. And we preview some new DVDs that we think you might like. I'm Roger Ebert. And I'm Richard Roper. Our first movie is American Wedding. It's not opening until next week, but we're going to give you a first look at it right here. It's the third slice of the American Pie series, and while most franchises tend to go soft and sweet by this point, I'm happy to report that wedding is just as horny, tacky, and funny as the first two. And yet there is a likability about the characters and some genuinely touching relationships. About half of the original cast is missing, but Jason Biggs is back as Jim, now engaged to Allison Hannigan's Michelle. Michelle, I, I, I'm going to ask you something that I've never asked you before. Is it kinky? I don't think so, no. You don't have to be embarrassed if you want to... Add more spiciness to our relationship. Like Bad Boys 2, American Wedding bases a lot of its humor on gay jokes. But the difference is the film itself isn't homophobic. It has fun at the expense of Stifler, who's mortified to be in a gay bar and yet has to prove he could be attractive to the same sex if he really wanted to. One of my favorite things about the American Pie movies is the friendship between Jim and his dad, played by SCTV great Eugene Levy. Honestly, would you have passed up sex with Nadia? Why, did she say something? Yeah, hypothetically, Dad. Oh, hypothetically. Well, I mean, you know, Jim, I'm a married man. I'm... If, if, if you weren't married? She, she's a college girl. If you were a college guy? In a heartbeat. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Sean William Scott's Stifler is one of the most original and memorable idiots in recent comedy history, and I say that with admiration. And speaking of brave comic turns, Jason Biggs probably doesn't get enough credit for his role as the centerpiece and basic straight man of this series. We don't like Jim, we won't cringe for him or root for him and his buddy. Sometimes the jokes fall flat, but there's always another visual gag, and sometimes you'll literally gag. <laughs> but the laugh ratio is easily high enough for me to recommend this film. Yeah, I liked it, too. And, you know, I think you really had your finger on something when you said the characters were likable, because a lot of vulgar and scatological stuff happens in this film, but it's not evil-spirited. It's not against these people. It's not cynical. They all have things they desire. Even Stifler yeah. turns out to have insecurities. And he wants to be accepted, too. He doesn't want to be the outsider all the time. So you kind of get affectionate toward these Yeah, they characters. should have called this Stifler's Big Movie because uh -huh. he really kind yeah. of steps into the forefront here. And, yeah, we are missing some of the original characters. But I think from the start, the key to this movie has been the screenplay. These various screenplays, they're, they're more intelligent. There's more wit there. The Eugene Levy character is wonderful. Because well, you know, the parents really care about their kids here, too. They're not just hapless buffoons. Eugene Levy's character there, which he's been developing through all three of these movies, is not your average dumb dad in a teenage comedy. And the best thing he does is to kind of take a beat and swallow when something incredibly shocking happens, yeah. like that scene in the restaurant, and then he kind of goes on. He, he loves his son. He knows his son means well, and so he accepts these amazing developments. You know, when I saw the first American Pie movie, I wouldn't have thought there were three films in the franchise, but I think there's even room for a fourth. I'm looking forward to American Parents. <laughs> I like that. Those poor kids. Very okay. Kind. It's amazing the Buffalo Soldiers is opening at all. Joaquin Phoenix in the movie plays a peacetime soldier getting rich on drugs and stolen goods. Well, this anti-war, anti-army movie premiered at Toronto a day before 9-11. It's opening was delayed until March 2003, but then the Iraq War made that bad timing, and then it moved to May the 9th, but war fever was high, and then there was the controversy over that poster with its motto, steal all that you can steal, and dollar signs for stars on the flag with Joaquin Phoenix making the peace sign. So first Miramax pulled the poster, then they put the poster back. Now at last, here's the movie with Phoenix as the Army's biggest crook. 1,000 gallons of mop and glow. My God, do we really need that much? Cleanliness is next to godliness. That's Ed Harris as an ambitious but clueless colonel. Scott Glenn plays the new top sergeant who's a straight arrow and reacts rather directly when Phoenix tries to bribe him with a television set. What I'm trying to say is... What's the 
going to take for you and me to make nice? Are you saying what I think you're saying? Buffalo Soldiers takes place in Germany in November 1989, although few of the soldiers know where Berlin is when the wall falls. It's like an updated Catch-22 with Phoenix as a former car thief who runs rings around everybody else on the base except for the top sergeant. It's dark humor, sometimes funny, deeply cynical, with strong performances, and it takes no prisoners. It's not politically correct right now. But thumbs up. Yeah, you're right. It's not PC, and that's one of the reasons I'm recommending this film. I like its dark edge. Uh, you mentioned Catch-22. It's also similar, I think, in some ways to MASH. Uh, Ed Harris's character kind of reminded mm -hmm. me of Colonel Henry Blake. And just as MASH was set in Korea, but could have been about the Vietnam War, it's the same thing with this movie. Set in the late 80s, but it could be about a lot of war, a lot of soldiers who maybe join up because they think it's a free ride. Mm -hmm. They think it's a way of getting out of trouble when the judge says, well, either six months in jail or you got to join the Army, and all of a sudden they find themselves mm -hmm. in this this crazy situation. I thought Joaquin Phoenix gave a brave performance here. He's not a very likable guy, and yet somehow I was kind of charmed by him. I right. wasn't. I wasn't charmed. He is really a dark guy. I mean, what yeah. about the scene where he comes upon the dead uh, soldiers who were driving trucks, and he says, let's steal the truck. I mean, he's a complete First, opportunist. He has no morals at all. He has no standards at all. Mm, I think he's he has some morals. For himself. No, I think he has some morals. But I also want to say, I don't think they needed to keep delaying the release of this film. It was okay to release it back in September of 01. They could have released it last spring. I'm glad it, it's out now, and I hope yeah, you can give it a chance. Yeah, I think that actually Miramax got a little timid about this and also about The Quiet American. I think Harvey Weinstein was just so affected by 9-11, understandably that he felt that certain movies just couldn't be seen, and it's a movie after yeah, all. Yeah, and this, it is a movie after all, and this film deserves to be seen. Okay, coming up next, four Sylvester Stallones in Try Kids 3D, Game Over. Am I insane? Completely. I have to save my sister. Sorry, Junie. But I have my own family to think about. We can't beat you, Arnold. <laughs> Our next movie is yet another summer sequel, <laughs> Spy Kids 3D, Game Over. It's further evidence that 3D is about 2.5D at best. Now, in 1838, physicist Charles Wheatstone invented a special viewing device that could show two images from two angles simultaneously. 165 years later, we have these. Not much advancement. You have to wear the glasses for most of the film, which follows child spy Juni Cortez as he goes inside a video game to stop an evil toy maker from taking over the minds of children everywhere. The toy maker will take over their minds. That's why we have to shut down the game. Shh. Carmen! What is she talking about? You didn't tell me, did you? I was getting around to it. What about the other side of level five? There is no other side. You'll be imprisoned in the game. One of my problems with the Spy Kids franchise is I just don't think the kids are natural actors. Not that I'm suggesting they take lessons from Sylvester Stallone, who plays the evil toy maker. All I wanted to do was right the wrong, start over a new world where everyone would get a second chance. Ricardo Montalban returns as grandfather who doesn't need his wheelchair once he's inside the game. Grandpa, you can walk. Oh, I can do more than that. Writer-director Robert Rodriguez has a frighteningly vivid imagination, and if you're going to do a 3D movie, I guess it's smart to place the action inside a video game. Still, the technology just isn't there. It's not close to giving us anything approaching a true three-dimensional experience, and given the price of today's movies, that's a lot of quarters to spend to watch a game where you can't even work the controls. Game over indeed. Thumbs down. You know, my dad took me to see the first 3D movie, Want a Devil. And okay. I've seen just about every 3D movie since then. And I'm going to tell you, 3D sucks <laughs> as a way of looking at movies. 2D looks a lot better. It's yeah. more convincing. It's brighter. It's crisper. It's cleaner. 3D, even the very best systems I've seen, kind of washes out things and makes them murky and doesn't add anything because I no. don't care if the arm comes toward me in the screen. Ah, I'm really ah. not really moved by that. Yeah. And so as I looked at this movie, I was irritated by the process and also disappointed as you mentioned, by the story, which really doesn't amount to much. So it's not really a movie, it's a video game that doesn't work. That's right. Pandora's Box is back, and Laura Croft has it later in the show. And coming up next, what we love about Seabiscuit.
The camera is right in the middle of the action in Seabiscuit, which we reviewed on last week's show. It opened Friday, and we both recommend this saga about a lazy little racehorse that became the sports hero of the 1930s. Toby McGuire plays the jockey who understands the horse, and Chris Cooper is wonderful as the trainer who believes Seabiscuit can come back after an injury. How far do you want me to take him? Shall he stop? Okay. That seems like a pretty good ride. Hope so. It's surprising how worked up I got during this movie about races that after all were run 65 years ago. You identify so strongly with the horse that you understand why millions of Americans loved him. Instead of sports cliches, the movie is very particular about the humans around Seabiscuit and why their personalities make it possible for the horse to win and for the horse to know that it can win. You know, it's amazing. There are so many great stories to be told in the world of horse racing mm -hmm. on the backstretch and the jockeys and the trainers and the owners. And I was thinking about it, talking to people about horse racing movies. Mm -hmm. And I like Let It Ride with Richard mm -hmm. Dreyfuss. And there have been some other good films over the years. But I don't think there's really been a great movie about thoroughbred racing until now. Except for National Velvet. National Velvet, okay. Mm -hmm. And Far Lap is a very good film yes, as well, but very too. few. Yeah. And this is, yeah. I think, the best I've ever yes, seen. Yes, it is. Okay, next is Hotel, the truly terrible avant-garde experiment from Mike Figgis, and probably the only movie that's ever going to feature Salma Hayek, Burt Reynolds, Lucy Liu from Charlie's Angels, and David Schwimmer from Friends. Here, Reese Iffens, the roommate from Notting Hill, is an abrasive director shooting a dogma film of the Duchess of Malfi. Right! I want all the actors, every single last one, Jack and you. I want you in that rehearsal now, rehearsing the shagging scene for tomorrow. Hayek's documentary filmmaker is supposed to be obnoxious, but her performance makes you feel like one of those dogs that are in pain when they hear high-pitched whistles. So we're going to follow some of your dogma rules. For example, no good lighting on your actors. I don't have the good lighting on me, but... I Figgis often divides the screen into quadrants, exploding the plot in favor of visual art. Figgis is a great talent, but it might be time to settle back to a more decaf style of filmmaking. Shooting a dogma movie within a movie, encouraging your actors to go wild to the point where they're barking, literally barking, it's all headache-inducing. If you came across hotel playing on monitors in a museum of contemporary art, it would grab your attention for a while, but as a movie, it's too pretentious, too confusing, and just... Too much. Well, I like the barking, and I like the movie. Now, I know it came really? out of England with terrible reviews, but the British always like to slap down anybody who gets out of line. What I like about <laughs> this movie is that he tries to do something new and often succeeds. Now, part mm -hmm. of it doesn't work. Sama Hike doesn't work. You're right about that. But there are erotic scenes in this movie that are truly erotic, and I say yeah. that often going from one year to another without seeing anything at all on the screen. That's sexy at all. I didn't think any of the supposedly erotic scenes were at mm. all erotic, or I didn't find any humor at all. I think it was just so aware of itself that I, not even that worked for me. So many movies don't try to do anything at all that I think Figgis gets points just for being out there, trying, really kind of putting himself on the line and doing new stuff and taking chances, and I like him for that. Okay, in a world of cookie-cutter action heroes, Laura Croft is an original. Lady Croft doesn't merely fight drug dealers, but she actually saves the world. Laura Croft Tomb Raider, The Cradle of Life, is better than the first Croft movie, which I also like. It has an untamed imagination that not only supplies bizarre, exotic locations, but has fun with them, creative fun. This time, Lady Croft is after the original Pandora's box, which brought life to Earth, but also contains death for the human race. Her sidekick, Terry Sheridan, played by Gerald Butler, follows her into some dicey situations like a crash landing in China. Ready. Now. Ready for board? and a quick high-rise escape. But she's no pushover in the romance department. I'm not leaving because I couldn't kill you. I'm leaving because I could. I think Angelina Jolie brings great spirit and energy to the role. She's not upstaged by the special effects, but she inhabits them easily. The movie looks good and has a lot of wit and doesn't just fill the screen with mindless violence, but has the kind of storytelling imagination we remember from the Indiana Jones movies. And I had to grin.
when she dismisses the Sunday school version of Pandora's Box. I'm wondering, what Sunday school does she go to? Well, I don't know, but I'd rather go to Sunday school than sit through this again. Oh, I think you are so smitten with Angelina Jolie What's that you're wrong forgiving. With that? Well, What's that, wrong with that's that? That's fine. Well, first of all, her British accent splits in and out. That's one thing wrong oh, with that. Well, I mean, and you talk about this story having imagination. Oh, we have another madman who wants to take over the world or destroy half the world so he can rule the other For half example, of the world. For example, this guy's secret lab oh. is in the middle of a mall, a shopping mall in China. I mean, that's kind of interesting. No, that's silly. It's ridiculous. And this is another one of those movies where the police never show up, even though there's shootouts everywhere. Oh, you do and not the, bring and, logic and, to a movie and, like this. Logic has no place in a movie logic. like this. I'm not saying logic. It's just silly and the stuff we've seen before. If it's going to be played for camp, maybe. But if we're supposed to take this as some sort of fun, no, adventure-filled romp, it just doesn't... I don't think it has the spirit and the humor that I'm you're giving it credit you, for. It's, I'm there for this movie all the way. I like the first one. I like this one better. I'm telling you... It's got it. It's silly, got something. Silly, it's cheesy, fun. silly, cheesy, and tacky. Okay. Not silly, not cheesy, not tacky. All three of those. Go Coming right up next, our favorite new so titles amazing. on home video, including a fresh look at a classic. Visit our website at ebertandroper.tv or at movies.com. Ebert and Roper's Thumbs Up Video is brought to you by Nestle Raisinets. At the movies or at home, Raisinets. From Too Fast, Too Furious, to Charlie's Angels, Full Throttle, to Bad Boys 2, most of this summer's action sequels have been big, loud duds. But last spring, one franchise got it right. Jackie Chan and Owen Wilson returned in Shanghai Nights, and it's my thumbs up video this week. Chan is out to avenge his father's death, and Wilson is falling in love with Chan's sister, but the London-based adventure is just a loose foundation for the intricately choreographed fight scenes as when Chan pays tribute to Gene Kelly. The DVD extras include a bounty of deleted scenes and a fight montage acknowledging that Shanghai Nights is a direct descendant of the silent era. Shanghai Nights is a light, funny, adventure-filled romp. Becky Chan's comeback after that tuxedo picture. Oh, man. Nicolas Cage was a charismatic actor right from the start. He had his first starring role in 1983 in Valley Girl. He was only 17, playing a showboat who lives in Hollywood and falls in love with a Valley Girl whose girlfriend think he is like totally grody and she should stick with her boring jock boyfriend. Like, I don't think you'd be any more welcome down there right now. I mean, let's leave the party. I'm so sure. The movie is new on DVD with lots of extras, including a commentary track by director Martha Coolidge and a conversation about the film between Cage and Coolidge. I didn't really have a method, so I was trying to search inside myself. Valley Girl has the honesty of a teenage movie like Say Anything, and Nicolas Cage creates an unforgettable character, part lounge lizard, part Elvis, part just an insecure kid. Valley Girl is my DVD preview coming out next week. You can see the seeds of Nicolas Cage's greatness oh, yeah. in that role. Oh, yeah. Also coming out on DVD, it's a special two-disc edition of one of America's and one of my favorite movies, Casablanca, with a commentary by my partner right here on the balcony. Terrific, terrific edition, anybody's library. Okay, looking ahead to next week's show, we'll review Jennifer Lopez okay. and Ben Affleck in Gili. Hello. And coming up next, Bob Dylan got a standing ovation before his movie premiered at Sundance this year, but he didn't get one afterwards. Also opening this week is Masked and Anonymous with Bob Dylan making his first movie appearance in 15 years in one of the worst movies of the last 15 years. Dylan gives a performance worthy of Madame Tussauds as a music legend who sprung from prison to play a benefit concert in the midst of a revolution. Overacting all around him are such great talents as Jeff Bridges, John Goodman, Penelope Cruz, and Luke Wilson. You ever read For Whom the Bell Tolls? Hemingway? There's a guy that could write. I haven't seen so many talented actors in such an utter mess since, well, since Hotel. It's as if Fellini had a brain cramp and turned over his camera to a blind man. You know, the sad thing is all these great actors are probably lured in by the presence of Dylan, who is not a generous actor. I mean, no. they're acting as hard as they can. He never has a speech more than one sentence long, which he delivers like he's some kind of an oracle, and the dialogue all sounds like it was rejected from old fortune cookies. Yeah, it's just awful. Just it's awful. terrible. Okay, recapping this week's movies. Two thumbs up for American Wedding. It opens next week. Two thumbs up for Buffalo Soldiers. 
Two thumbs down for Spy Kids 3D. Game over. We split on Hotel. We split again on Laura Croft Tomb Raider, The Cradle of Life. And two thumbs as far down as a thumb can go for Masked and Anonymous. Remember, you can hear all our recent reviews at ebertandroper.tv or at movies.com and read us in print at suntimes.com. And until next week, the balcony is closed. I don't understand why you don't respond more positively to Angelina Jolie as Laura Croft. This is a great force on the screen. I she think, is fun. Well, she looks great, but I knew we were in trouble when she punched the shark. I love that oh, thing. Oh, sure. Big savings on summer sizzlers at Brand Source. Visit BrandSource.com for the location nearest you. Brand Source, your neighborhood expert. Benadryl EFX, the easiest and fastest way to lose weight. Guaranteed. Finally, something that works at GMC. One phone call. Everything you need to find a great dentist has been pre-screened for you by us. So call us today. The Conair Bath Spa with a powerful dual water jet. It revives you. It relieves sore muscles. It pamps you all over. Experience it. Closed captioning for Ebert and Roper is brought to you by... You've always trusted Monarchy for mufflers. Now you can trust them to service a whole lot more. Monarchy Car Care Center, our new name says it all.